Jesus is the hope of the world, and he established his church to carry that hope into a world that often feels hopeless. When we follow God's plan, God works through the church, and the church works. When the church works, lives are changed at home, in the world, and even at work. Join us as we learn to be the church at work. Today we're going to look at leaders at work. Here are today's guests. Let's give our guests a warm Black Hawk welcome. Good morning, Black Hawk. I'm Curtis Smith. Welcome to the first, first service at Black Hawk in quite some time. We're starting a new series. Uh, being the church at work is our focus over these next seven weeks. And we're going to start today by looking at leadership. Each week, over these next seven weeks, we're going to have a group discussion with several members of our church body who are focused in one area, and today we are starting with leaders. And I want to talk with Jason and Linda and Arlen and Eric about leading at work and how we can be the church at work through what we do. It's sometimes easy to sit here on Sunday and feel good about being the church. You get pumped up with the worship team. Kevin delivers a great message, but then you get out into the real world Monday through Friday, and you can lose a little bit of steam. When you guys think about being the church at work, what jumps to mind? Anything, Jason, comes to mind right away? Uh, people. Uh, I think fundamentally it's all about the people that we get to lead. So trying to take the message of the gospel to the people that we lead is uh, kind of step one. Arlen? Can I say something about I start yeah. with identity. The songs we just sang, mm. I'm a child of God. I'm the son of God. That's where it starts for me. One of the things that I love about this group is that you're really very diverse. You're all Christian leaders, but you're in very different settings. Uh, Jason and Eric in settings that are distinctly not Christian. Linda, uh, as executive director here at Blackhawk Ministries and head of schools at Blackhawk Christian School, I, I hope it is a very Christian setting for you, Monday through Friday. Good, good, that's good to hear. And Arlen, you're in a largely Christian setting, so let's talk about that difference. Eric, maybe let's start with you. You, you get out of here on a Sunday, you go into a world Monday, uh, it doesn't really feel like Blackhawk Ministries, I'm guessing. Uh, no, no. <laughs> when, I, when I go to work on a Monday morning, um, we have 20 people on our team, and I think it might be one of the most diverse teams in Fort Wayne. We have everything from atheists to, uh, to Catholic Christians to Christians to people that uh, I'm not, maybe are agnostic. And so uh, you couple that with a board of 53 people uh, that, that I'm involved with that are all CEOs or executives of Fort Wayne. Uh, and you can imagine the diversity, uh, Republicans, Democrats, uh, people that believe a lot of different things. And so it doesn't necessarily feel like church. <laughs> uh, but it is, um, I, I, I find it uh, very exciting because when I go to work, um, I've got to figure out on a daily, almost hourly basis how to integrate my faith into what I do in a way that's not offensive, but also is um, honoring to Christ and honoring to my belief system. Mm. Jason, you're in a similar setting, uh, not a Christian environment, people with all kinds of different backgrounds. How do you step into that space and lead as a Christian amongst non-Christians. Yeah, much like uh, Eric, it, it is very different. Uh, you walk out, I, I manage a team that's all across the Eastern United States and it's a group of salespeople and uh, largely non-believers. And as you can imagine, kind of the stereotypical thought of what sales folks have to go through, whining and dining and everything else that happens, um, that's my life on a daily basis. So for me, the ability to walk into a situation and bring Christ into that um, really with love for the people that I manage and lead. Um, I think that's number one, just showing the love that I can because um, they're all in different places. And so for me to be able to love them where they're at and then show consistency in what I do. Mm. Linda, uh, Arlen. Can I comment on that? Yeah, go ahead, Eric. You know, I think that's a real key um, that Jason just said there. 
you know, I've really learned over my career just to love people where they're at. You know, my responsibility is not to be the Holy Spirit in their life. Yeah. You know, my responsibility is to love them, be there for them. And what I found is when I'm, when I'm that way, when they have a problem in life, they often come and then they start asking questions about life that then get us into a deeper spot. Mm. Linda Arlen, let's look at it from the reverse. Just because you're among Christians all day, Linda, doesn't mean leading is easy, does it? You know, I thought about this during the week when we were getting ready for this, is in some ways we're exactly the same as Jason and Eric, and in some ways we're entirely different. Our people come as diverse um, with their expectations, their needs. People are people, kind of backing off what Eric said, we all come to work every day with needs and gifts. Um, so our di jobs are totally different in that we have a uni unified belief system, but there's so much diversity that leading, if you think for a second that um, there isn't the diversity, we feel that every day, and I think we should. That's how God made us. And Arlen, I assume it's the same thing for you. Again, largely Christian, but very diverse. Yes, yes our, our, the owner of our company, he desires financial, cultural, and eternal returns. So we're very clear about having a three return environment. And so in many ways, I have an opportunity to shepherd here and come alongside life group leaders and others here at this church when I'm here. At church, at, uh, at work, it's a very similar thing where I view myself as a shepherd and uh, shepherding the team. And of course, there's also expectations from a business perspective as well. Yeah, I would say because of our uniqueness that we have of being in a Christian environment, that that um, collaboration, that unity that we have is something that sparks us and moves us forward um, because of the unified spirit that we have. I want to I want to just say one more thing too. Linda said we're people, and where I work, we're people as well. So we have plenty of conflict, plenty of opportunity, and we have some of the same issues that a normal. Uh, business environment would have where we're trying to figure out what to do and how to do it, and those are difficult things to go through. I guess those of us who don't work in a distinctly Christian environment would like to assume, though, moving forward past tough times, forgiveness, those things hopefully abound maybe a little bit more in your settings? Yeah, I often tell parents when they're coming and talking about, you know, what's the difference between a public school and a Christian school, it's like, we basically do the same things, but our route is just a little bit different. So um, as we resolve conflict, as we resolve moving forward goals, uh, vision, I think the unity helps us, but sometimes that can snag us out in not being as creative as we could be. So having some diversity is a good thing that keeps us moving forward. I'll just say one thing about that. I think transparency and vulnerability are key for a leader. And in my context, I've had numerous in, uh, opportunities to confess my sin. And I'll just give you one example. A few years ago, the Lord laid it on my heart that for me, my sarcasm is very condescending and prideful. And he laid it on my heart that I needed to confess that to our team and ask them to help me. And that sort of thing, which I would say is, that's what we do in our church body here, confess our sins to each other. I have an opportunity to do that at my work, and it creates an environment of vulnerability. Mm. And that probably is one of the unique things that we have, is we have that commonness of Christ. Um, so being able to lead with that type of thing, not that it doesn't exist in the marketplace, but that unified spirit of Christ, where you can be vulnerable and honest, and you know that there's going to be likely forgiveness on the other side. It makes a unique culture to work in. You know, I'll jump on top of that because even in our workplace, if you lead, and I'll encourage the leaders out there, uh, if you lead folks and you lead with a transparent, vulnerable mindset, it really does make a difference. I mean, I try and do that even with a group of non-believers that I lead, and they can see a difference because I come to them and I'm just I, oftentimes when I interview folks, I tell them, you're always going to know where you stand, good or bad. I'm going to be very transparent with you. And I think it really helps the culture that you lead. Earlier, Jason, you mentioned a word that Kevin is going to focus on when he preaches this morning about Daniel, consistency. Being consistent as a leader seems really important for those of us who report to people. And I know some of you do report to people. Uh, what does that bring to your followers, to the people who report to you, when you are consistent as a leader. Eric, how important is that concept to be the same, to be consistent? 
I'm not sure I've ever been accused of being consistent. That's why I asked you yeah, okay, ex good. Uh, specifically. You know, I, I have a theory of leadership uh, that actually um, I uh, am constantly challenging and constantly changing the game. Um, but here's what I'm consistent. I'm consistent in my love for them. So while I might change the game and I might change the way I approach uh, people, I'm consistent in my love, and then the second thing I'd say is I'm consistent in the fact that I try to approach them in the way that's most effective for that person, which means you really got to know the people that you're working with. And let me tell you guys, there's no super leadership pill that I take every morning. <laughs> you know, um, I fail all the time. I think what's allowed me to be somewhat successful in leadership is the humility to be coached by the people that I serve. And I serve the people, my 20 staff, and I also serve um, leaders across this city and in this state. So um, I'm constantly willing to be challenged by them, but consistency to me is a consistency of love and a consistency of respect and a consistency of treating people in the way that you'd want to be treated. And that's where I try to be consistent. I think that's one of the biggest changes I've seen across the board when you own leadership whether it's a book or a conference that you go to, um, I'm probably the eldest person on the stage. No, I am the eldest person on the <laughs> stage. And I think over my life, seeing leadership really change from being top-down delivery of information where I, I say you do to much more collaboration, much mm. more high value, much more authenticity of leadership, I think is become coming to the norm, certainly in our alumni's world. But as I talk with people who are in the business sector, I think that is progressively permeating um, our leadership. The other point that Kevin is gonna show us through the life of Daniel is to be fruitful with your leadership. And, and you're all in settings where you, you want to love and you want to lead consistently, uh, consistently and you want to value people as people, but you do have a bottom line. You do have results that you're driving after. Arlen, how do you focus on people and yet focus on being fruitful as a company? One of the things I want to say about that is effort. There's a verse in Colossians that says, work hard is unto the Lord. And so this idea of effort or excellence or doing my best every single day and giving my all, and uh, I think that's a piece of it. And then the other, other piece would be just high expectations. And I think for me, it starts with setting high expectations for myself. Mm. It's interesting how God places each of us within the context that will best function. I don't think I could function well in Jason's context or Eric's as a leader. And God didn't ask me to. He didn't give me the grace to function in their context. Yeah. He gave me the grace to function in my context. And so in my particular situation, I have people who are surrounded, I'm surrounded with who also have very high expectations. So I don't have to be as forceful as other leaders might need to be in order to have those results and the high expectations. Mm. Jason, you're in a setting where being fruitful often means hitting that dollar mark, hitting those sales numbers. That's a tough thing to balance with leading consistency, with consistency and leading as a Christian. That's, that's a good point because it really is in sales. Bottom line, we need to hit our number. And uh, if you're not hitting your number, then there's an expectation that you get managed out. It's a kind word for saying fired. Um, so <laughs> that's the it, Christian <laughs> phrase for getting fired, managed out. We, Jot we, even, that you, down. we even use that in our vernacular. So. Um, <laughs> Really, it is uh, all about, as I go back to, how do I have high expectations, really want you guys to do the very best that they can, but if they aren't meeting the goal, I mean, honestly, it really comes down to, it may be better for them to be somewhere else, because if they're not fruitful, they're not going to be satisfied in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's my goal to make them as successful as possible and, and have full job enjoyment and everything else, and if they're not hitting their number, they're not. I, I want to end with each of you may be giving a thought about leadership, but through this lens. Uh, you all have titles like president, CEO, executive director, vice president, big titles, but all of us really are leaders. Whether you're the stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad, uh, whether you're kind of mid-management, maybe you're just a, a normal worker, you still have the opportunity to lead as a Christian every day. So with that in mind, Maybe, Eric, let's start with you and go down the line. What would you say to someone who wants to lead better? Yeah, I, that's what I was thinking. You know, we often focus on the title in America of leadership. And, 
At the end of the day, from my perspective, leadership is about influence. And almost everyone in this room has influence over a group of people or a bigger group of people. And um, many times in my environment, the best leadership that occurs is the leadership at, at the grassroots, you know, where you're interacting on a more daily basis, peer to peer. Uh, so I just really encourage you not to focus on the position. Sometimes the position actually gets, makes it tougher to lead, but focus on what God has called you to do to lead where he has placed you and be faithful and then just watch what he does. It's pretty exciting. Just building on that, every day I pray, Lord, lead me to someone today that I can help or lead me to someone today who can help me. I never know which it's going to be, but I would just encourage each of us to pray for an opportunity to help someone and to have that influence. Yeah, and for me, I think knowing who you are, and that's who you are in Christ and who he made you to be, you know, knowing that we were only called to do one thing, and that was to serve him. So knowing your mission statement, I know that was something I had worked for years on mission statements for corporations or businesses or churches. Um, and really, I realized a few years back that I didn't have a mission statement for myself. So really spent some time looking into scripture and defining who I am, and really who I'm not, and then moving forward with that. So I think as a leader, being comfortable with who you are, what you believe God wants you to do, continually seeking that, and then getting rid of all the noise in the rest of the world around you with expectations. I think for me it's important that as a leader you focus on being humble and consistently learning, and consistently learning from the people that are below you as, the people, as well as the people that are leading you. And so that's really key. And then another point that I wanted to make was when I can't help but think of leading and think of Lynette and my kids. That's where it really starts for me is leading them well. And then I, I have the ability to go out and lead in the marketplace, but it's really important for me to do that. Great points. Can we thank our leaders for sharing what it's like to be leaders at work? Thank you so much. We're gonna be doing this each of the seven weeks. I feel a bit intimidated to try to preach after you just heard so many great sermons uh, from that group. I am so, so blessed by you guys. Thank you for sharing your heart today. I pray that you have found blessing in that and some applicability to your life. And that's what you're going to find every week in this series, Church at Work, is that we're all the church. You know what's unique about each of us that ties us all together at the same time is that A, we are the church in different ways, in different settings, but there's something that ties us all together. We are all the church, and so we're all called to be the church at work. And when we do things God's way, God will bless his church. He'll work through his church, and then the church is going to work. It's going to function like God has intended for it to function. So today, turn to Daniel chapter 6, maybe a book you don't frequent, and so I want to give you a moment to turn there. Every week in this series, we will hear from different arenas of life. We will hear from different lines of work, and then we're going to tie it to a biblical, I stopped saying character a long time ago, because guess what? They are not characters. They're real people just like you and just like me. So we're going to look at a biblical person every single week, and I want to welcome you to our first, first service. Today, I would be remiss if I didn't pause and say thank you for coming in the rain uh, to our early service, and many of you are watching us online today. We are so excited about creating continued capacity for people to plug into what God is doing. And we've got ministries launching all around our church today because we believe that the church should work. We believe that the church is the unit that God built to carry the hope of the world, who is Jesus, into this world that so many times, can I get an amen, feels hopeless but we know the hope of the world. And Daniel is a leader. Daniel is one that we can learn a lot from today. And as you find your way to Daniel, there's a statement that's in your notes that I want to challenge you to write down no matter where you're at in life that really is going to drive this series. And it comes from the words of Paul, the Apostle Paul. 
And it's in Colossians. Don't turn there. You can jot this down. It's in your notes. Colossians 3, verses 14 through 17. He tells us to put on love above everything else. And he talks about this inward putting on, understanding, as has been discussed today, a putting on of our identity, of who we are in Christ, putting on of love so that we worship well together, so that we make a difference together. It's an inward thing that turns into an outward thing. And the statement I want you to write down is this. We desire in this series, because we hope it's way more than a series, that we learn to be the church in a way that our vertical relationship impacts our horizontal reality. And in the book of Daniel, that's exactly what God is doing. He is building a relationship vertically with people so that the horizontal realities of their life would be forever altered and forever changed. And hear me when I tell you, when we choose to be the church, it will forever impact your horizontal realities. It probably brought some challenging realities in the building with you today. Am I right about it? probably got a few challenges, as did Daniel. And so I want to talk about that. The book of Daniel is all about God changing realities through normal, everyday people. In this case, Daniel became a big-time leader, but he didn't really start there. He got promoted quickly. And so in this book of Daniel, Daniel is a type of Christ, is what we'll say a lot of times as we study Scripture, because every book of the Bible even before Jesus came onto the scene, ultimately points to Jesus. And in the book of Daniel, there are so many things about Daniel, about the story of the Israelites, because they're in exile. They are in captivity in Babylon at this time, and Daniel is one of them. God's people have been exiled from their homeland. Everything that they knew, they've left, and they've been held in captivity in Babylon. And so they're in this foreign land, but God is changing their reality. But you should know a few things about this culture, this Jewish culture, uh, that I think will, if you'll hang in there with me for a moment, will intersect with your life. And when we think about this Jewish culture, they're in Babylon, they're in captivity, they're away from everything that they've known, they're in exile. But in Jewish culture, these people would have a spiritual identity that's tied to a physical geography, a spiritual identity that's tied to a physical geography. Let me give you a few examples. The promised land. If you've read about the Israelites' journey, they were promised spiritually by God something that tied them to a destination, a physical destination called the promised land. Perhaps the best example is the temple. It's not like today. We're talking about being the church in our Monday through Saturday but in that day and age, they would go to a physical destination called the temple, and that is where they would offer sacrifices to earn favor with God. That is where they would find the presence of God, and so their spiritual identity and their experience of God was tied to a physical location called the temple. Another example is mountains. In the Psalms, it says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. And so they, in mountains in their culture would represent expectation. They were looking for something. And the law that governed the land of Moses came from a mountain. He got the law of the Lord from a mountain, and he brought it down to the people. And so you see this spiritual identity tied to a physical geography, a physical location. That's a little different than it is for us today. But here's what I think you might identify with. For these people that were in exile, Daniel was one of them. They were in captivity in Babylon. They couldn't go to the temple. It was a foreign land, and it would feel nearly impossible for them to integrate their faith into everyday life because they were in a foreign land. Does that make sense? And you can kind of see where it starts to come to fruition in our lives. Do you ever feel like you leave church on Sunday feeling all fired up because you've heard the word, we've raised our hands in worship, we're unified in spirit, but then you tackle a Monday through Saturday that feels like a foreign land? It feels like there's no way I can integrate my faith into my everyday life Monday through Saturday. And I want you to realize today that we, like Daniel's horizontal reality, the things that he saw, we, just like him, engage a captive society. If you notice that society is in captivity, we're held captive by fear, we're held captive by all of these different approaches to faith and religion and eternal life, and we're confused just like the Israelites, just like Daniel would have felt. It feels like we are in a foreign land when we go into our weeks. Can I get an amen? We're all in that boat together. And in fact, that's a pretty biblical principle. I think when I read scripture, I read things like, this world is not my home. 
And so we are called to go into a foreign land, and that is where Daniel was at. Now, let's make it practical, and I want to give you a couple of thoughts about Daniel's faith. But let's make it practical for a moment about this captivity, this foreign land. I want to give you a thought, because some of you, like the Israelites, I can tell you, they wanted to run. They were in captivity. They wanted to run right back to their comfort zone. They wanted to run right back to what was familiar in their life where they could worship and experience God in the ways that they had for many, many years. And maybe you're like them, and you're like what Daniel would have certainly wrestled with in his own heart and emotions, and you just are ready to run. You ever felt that way? Like, I just want to run away. I just want to run from what is, and you're begging God to get you out of something so you can go back to something else or go to a new season in your life. And my challenge to you is this, and this is what we see from the story of Daniel, both as a leader, but really as a person who was trying with all of his might to follow his God. And I want to challenge you with what I see in his life, and that is maybe it's time for you to stop asking God to get you out and invite God in. Maybe the best story that illustrates that more than anything else is Daniel chapter 6, where Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Have you heard that story before? We've heard it as kids, and when we read it again, it's much like David and Goliath. We wonder why we read it to our kids uh, when we read how the story goes. It's one of those stories. But don't you know that Daniel wanted God to get him out of the lion's den? But Daniel took a little bit of a different approach, and I want to talk about what led up to his experience of the lion's den and then what happened within it. Let's look together at how Daniel invited God in. You should know the first nine verses. We won't read those, but we see that Daniel gets exalted and promoted. He was one of three presidents that were over some 120 leaders in this nation. Uh, And the king had appointed Daniel and was exalting and promoting Daniel above everybody else. And Did you know that when you follow Jesus and when you find success and fruit because God blesses your life, whether it is fruit as we would typically define it in the secular world or not, that there will be an attack. Did you know that? You will be attacked if you follow Jesus. Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. It's not an easy thing to do. You'll be attacked. But when you find success and when God blesses you, people will envy you as well. And Daniel found that because these leaders looked for ways to tear Daniel down. They wanted to find ways to accuse Daniel of something so that they could get the position because it tells us in those first nine verses that Daniel was going to be eventually over the kingdom. He was all going all the way to the top because God was blessing him because he had an excellent spirit in him. In verse 3 is what it says. And his promotion led to an envy from his fellow leaders. And they started scheming against Daniel, trying to get King Darius to issue a decree. And he eventually, in verse 9, issues this decree that says anyone who worships or has a petition to anyone but the king in the next 30 days would be thrown into the den of the lions. Here's the thing. They knew the only way they would capture and catch Daniel and be able to accuse him is if something they came up with would intersect with and conflict with the faith that Daniel obviously held so truly and so tightly to in his life. That's going to lead us to our first thing that we're going to talk about in a minute. And so they dug into that, and the decree, the injunction was signed by King Darius in verse 9. Let's look at two things. In your notes, you can follow along with me. I want to give you two things that have been mentioned from this stage already, things that Daniel did to invite God into his world. Number one is that Daniel had a consistent faith. He had a consistent faith. Verse 4 tells us that he was getting promoted, but they were looking to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could not find, this is verse 4, they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. Daniel was faithful. He had a faith that was consistent. They knew the only way they could catch him is if it had to do with this consistent faith that he was pursuing. Look there with me at verses 10 through 17. Let's read that together. It follows the injunction being signed by the king, and it says, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, what did he do? He ran away. No. What did he do? He did the consistent thing he always did. He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God as he had done previously. That sounds pretty consistent to me. Are you with me? 
as he had done previously. Verse 11, then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning this injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any God or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? Is it true or not? The king answered and said, the thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. They answered and said before the king Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction that you have signed. But he makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, verse 14, when he had heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel because he loved him. He had been promoting him all of these days, and he wanted him to run the kingdom. And so when he realized what had happened, he felt caught, and he was distressed. And so and it says, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. And then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, No, O king, that this law of the Medes and Persians, that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. You are locked in. They knew they had him. They knew they had Daniel. Verse 16, then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of the lions. The king declared to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually. What's that word again? Whom you serve continually. Sounds like a consistent faith to me. Who you serve continually. May he deliver you. Verse 17. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. Does that sound familiar, by the way? You talk about a type of Christ. Does that point to a Jesus that might come? That's a whole other sermon that I won't preach today. But, boy, it's a good sermon. You should should preach it someday, or maybe I should. And so the stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Daniel's life was over. It was done. The king knew it. But he hoped maybe this God that Daniel keeps following would do something to save Daniel because he loved Daniel. And here's the thing. Why were they able to catch Daniel in the first place? Because they knew he was going to be consistent with his prayer. I think we live in a day. Can I share something with you? We talked about consistency with these leaders on the stage. We live in a day where consistency of faith stands out like never before. If you'll be consistent in your prayer life, if you'll be consistent in who you are in Christ, then does that mean you never change anything, you never lead the way, you never grow? No, it means that you're the same person because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that we too, like Daniel, could be predictable and consistent that our faith is going to be what defines us and what drives us in our life. That's why they knew they could catch Daniel. We know he's going to pray, and so if we can get the king to sign this injunction saying you can't pray to anyone but the king, then I know I can catch Daniel because he's so consistent. I pray that my persecution in my life comes because I'm so consistent in my faith in Jesus Christ. And boy, does that consistent faith not stand out in a world that's full of inconsistency. God has called us to have a consistent faith like Daniel. And you think about Daniel. Daniel prayed consistently not to get points with God, but to pursue the presence of God. I hope you're not here and you're not worshiping and you don't pray to get points with God because can I tell you, if you're on a point system with God, you're going to lose. You can't get enough points to make your way into heaven. You can't be good enough. We need the presence of an almighty God in our lives to meet us in our mess, to meet us in the depths of our sin. Because he is consistent, so can we be. That's the kind of God that we serve. And I thank God for how Daniel demonstrated that because I believe consistent faith comes. Hear me. Have you ever met mean Christians? Can we just be real for a few minutes? You ever met a mean Christian? I'll tell you, some some of the meanest people I've ever known claim to be Christians. Can I just be real? But it shouldn't be. And I believe that consistent faith comes when our public worship is a result of our private practice. And that's what we see in Daniel's life. His private practice led to a public worship. But sometimes we put on a church smile, we put on a show, but I believe Sunday mornings, hear me when I say this, I believe that Sunday morning should be a time where we come together to celebrate corporately what God is doing in our lives personally. It shouldn't be your only fuel injection for the week. This should not be the only time that you come and get fuel for your Christian faith. 
I hope you leave here fired up. I hope I can inspire and encourage you. I know the Word of God will do just that. And our commitment here is every time we gather, that's exactly what you'll experience. But you need more fuel than just Sunday mornings. You need consistent fuel in your life so that God is working in you so much personally that we come together corporately every Sunday and we just celebrate the lives of people just like we did today. That's why I wanted to make sure we hear real stories from real people. I love how Arlen just talked about how God had led him to be transparent and how he shared as a leader. Leaders shouldn't do that, right? The world might say. Well, that makes you look weak. No, it makes you strong because when I am weak, I am made strong. And so when he confessed his shortcomings, God strengthened his leadership because he was consistent in his faith, not just on Sunday, but on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. That's what God has called us to. But it doesn't mean you work harder. It doesn't mean you may need to work a little harder, but the church at work doesn't come from the work you can do. It comes from a work of God because of his presence in your life being made real that even when your work falls short, and can I get an amen that it's going to? It's going to fall short when it happens that God's work inside of you is bigger than the work you could accomplish on your own. That's what happened with Daniel. I believe consistency is the key to a Christian walk today. We need consistent Christians who are the same just like Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why? It's in your notes. I believe that when Jesus comes into what I'm into, something good will come out of what I'm into. I want to say that again. I believe that when Jesus comes into what I'm into, something good will always come out of what I'm into. It's what happened with Daniel. He's thrown into the lion's den. We're going to see that in just a moment. He's locked in with the lions, and he had to answer the question, am I going to invite God in or just beg God to get me out? And Daniel said, I'm going to invite my God in. He's been with me through the fire. He's been with me through exile. He's been with me through all of my days. And so I want to bring God into what I'm into. And then that leads us to the last thing I want to talk to you about, and that is Daniel's faith. Number two is a fruitful faith. It's a fruitful faith. Verses 18 through 24. Did you know that when you're consistent in your faith, it'll always lead to fruit? When you're consistent in your faith, it'll always lead to fruit. Does that mean sales? I don't know. It might. It might not. It might mean a lack of sales, but it will lead to spiritual fruit. And let's define fruit and look at fruit for a moment before we read Daniel's story and how this closes. I love the fruit of the Spirit. It's Galatians 5, if you want to jot it down. Galatians 5, it talks about how the, the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, the flesh and the Spirit, that they're in conflict with each other. They're in conflict. We're constantly in turmoil. Can you, can you relate with that in your life? Your flesh and the Spirit are in constant turmoil, and they work against each other. But when we walk by the Spirit, you will not des- gratify the desires of the flesh. Daniel got that, and he led into a fruitful walk with God. Look at verse 18 with me. Let's see how the story unfolds. Then the king, verse 18, went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Because he loved Daniel. He didn't want him to die, but he knew that was pretty imminent. Verse 19, then at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. And as he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, in this phrase, look at it again, has your God whom you serve continually some consistent faith was about to lead to some fruit, been able to deliver you from the lions. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. Can you imagine the surprise? A whole night went by and said, hey, bud, just hanging out down here with the kitty cats. (laughs) There he was, O king, may you live forever. May God, my God, sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I've done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no harm was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and this is the part where it gets a little bit gruesome, that, you know, you wonder why we read that story at bedtime to our kids sometimes. Verse 24, we'll answer that question for you. He commanded that those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before, it gets worse, and before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Mm. Daniel had fruit in his life. And you wonder, why did the lions not eat Daniel? But they were hungry. 
I want to get there in a minute, but I want to tell you this before, before we get to that question, that you have an enemy who 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 which says, be sober-minded and be watchful because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a what? Like a roaring lion. Like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We have a real enemy who wants to do real damage and devour us in our lives. In verse 24, we see that that lion, the devil, is, is hungry in your life, but we saw that these physical lions were hungry. Did you notice that it says before they even hit the ground, they overpowered them and, I mean, need I go on? Wow. They were hungry lions, but yet Daniel had spent all night with them, and so why did they not eat Daniel? I want to just propose something that just hit me like never before when I'm talking about fruit and the fruit of the Spirit. Daniel was walking in the Spirit. Daniel had a fruitful faith, and lions are carnivores. Lions eat flesh. Remember the difference in the flesh and the fruit just a minute ago? Lions eat flesh. Lions eat meat. And the people who are walking in the flesh, they got devoured before they hit the floor. But guess what? Lions don't eat fruit. Lions don't eat the fruit of the Spirit, and because Daniel was walking in the Spirit, he sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lion. And today, I want you to hear me when I tell you that you have an enemy who wants to devour you like a roaring lion, but that lion can't eat the fruit of, my spirit, of the Spirit of our living God, of my God, of my Jesus. He doesn't eat the fruit of his Spirit. And so let's walk in the Spirit of God today, knowing that we can't be devoured by an enemy who only eats flesh. But when we walk in the flesh, we set ourselves up to be devoured. I'm glad that Daniel gave us an example of consistent faith, of this fruitful faith, and then God got some glory. Look at how the story ends with me. Daniel chapter 6, start with verse 25, the last four verses. I love how this story ends. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples and nations and languages that dwell in all the earth. Pretty big letter. Wish I could do that, right? Well, guess what? We can as the church according to the point of the series. He says, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, quite a different decree here, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. His dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions, so this Daniel prospered. During the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian, God got glory from entering and being invited into the lion's den. Do you have a lion's den that maybe you need to stop begging God to get you out of and maybe start inviting him into? Invite God into your lion's den, and I believe he's going to do something amazing. When I think of this series, I've been thinking about a song. It's an old song that I used to sing. I could play it on the guitar back in the day when I was a youth pastor and my wife would sing it. And I want you to hear just part of it because that's really our hope in this series. As we look at Daniel and we look at these leaders and we start this series, The Church at Work, we want to have a consistent faith. We want to have a fruitful faith. And the song just simply says, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving i'll be a living sanctuary for you i want to ask you to bow your heads close your eyes and think about how you can be sanctuary a living sanctuary that's what being the church is about a living sanctuary, a walking church. You are the walking church. And when our faith is consistent, it becomes fruitful. And Daniel showed us what that looks like. We can be pure and holy, tried and true, not because we're so good, but because Jesus already was. And so today, no matter where you find yourself today, maybe it's time to take a step of faith. And today, I want to start by talking to those of you who would say, I need Jesus. I don't know that I have faith that has given me eternal life. I don't know that if I died today, I don't know that if I died today that I would spend eternity with Jesus. Your sin separates you from God. You can't get there on your own, but Jesus died and paid a price for you after living a sinless life. You could never live so that you could be forgiven and free. And then after dying that death that you couldn't die, he paid the price you couldn't pay. And after that, he went to a borrowed tomb. It was borrowed because he had no plans to stay there because three days later, he walked out with a victory 
a victory we couldn't win, and it's a victory that he knew today maybe would be the day that you could experience. And so if that's you and you say, I need to know that I'm saved and I don't have that assurance, cry out to him right now. I'm not going to lead you in a prayer because I think your heart is screaming it. Will you cry out to him and ask him to save you in your own words? God wants to hear your heart. And I know, I know, I promise, based on God and his word, that you will be saved. If that's you, will you take a moment and do that right now where you sit? Nobody's looking around, but I believe somebody must be here that took that step today. Maybe you're watching us online, you took that step. But somebody that you didn't expect on a cold, rainy day like today, you would show up to church and God would do something big, but he did. And if he did, nobody's going to take you out of here, but I want to give you next steps. I want to make sure you hear those next steps of what God wants to do in your life. And if that's you, I want to start by just praying for you. So on the count of three, I just want to ask you if you will, just raise your hand and say, pray for me, Pastor. I invited Jesus to sur I surrendered my life to Jesus. One, two, three. Would you raise your hand? Say, pray for me, Pastor. I see you in the back, ma'am. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Praise God in this place. Anybody else? Keep your hands up for a moment. Say, today's that day. God bless you. You can put your hands down. God, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for how you're working in your people. And I praise God with the angels in heaven for salvation and for the steps, God, that believers have been led to take. A phone call they're going to make, a, an apology to be issued. But God, you are working in this place. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for a faith that can be consistent and fruitful because Jesus is in our midst. God, we love you. We praise you. We ask it all in the holy, powerful, matchless, amazing, name of Jesus, the name above every name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's celebrate today. Let's sing and shout and join the angels in heaven and welcome these to the family of God.